Okay, morning year 12. We're going to be looking at Julia Major, or Julia the Elder, who I have called the bad girl of the Principate. Uh, she, I know that Jan is a great fan of her, and in a moment she'll tell us a little bit about why she likes her so much. Okay, So today we're going to look at how Augustus used his family. We're going to look at how he projected an image of moral governance. So I will say a little bit about the Lex Julia, even though we need to cover them in a little bit more detail. And then we're going to end by sort of saying, arguably, this is a sign of Augustus's ruthless nature. So if we want to take a critical view like Jana does, against Augustus, we will see this as his ruthless, morally censorious nature. Of course, there's always another way of looking at it, okay? So let's just do a quick little recap of Marcellus, just to remind you of a few things. Marcellus over here looking absolutely beautiful, done in the classical Greek style, like we saw from the Prima Porta and from the Arapacus that Augustus favoured for himself, never ageing, done in kind of, uh, you know, great divine proportions, etc. And I'm going to start by saying that in terms of the succession then, we know that uh, there was a program of accelerated promotion for Augustus's successes, and the first one was Marcellus. We know that he rides on the Triple Triumph in 29 BC alongside Caesar to the right of him, and that echoes what was done for Octavian, the young Octavian, with Julius Caesar. We know that he's given the honor of marrying Augustus's only child, Julia, in 25 BCE, we know that Suetonius in chapter 66 <clears throat> tells us that um, Agrippa was very uh, resentful and jealous and he actually took himself into exile. Now that is very disputable as we know and I would always urge you <clears throat> to evaluate Suetonius when you use him and remind the examiner that you're aware that Suetonius' historiography is quite defective. We know that when um, uh, Augustus became very ill that he gave the signet ring to Agrippa and not to Marcellus, and that is very interesting. We know that when Marcellus dies in 23 BCE, that the evidence is that Augustus is absolutely grief-stricken. He builds the theatre of Marcellus and he puts uh, Marcellus into the mausoleum so that uh, Marcellus becomes the first of the Judeo-Claudians uh, Judeo who is put into um, the uh, mausoleum. And we also know from uh, the Aeneid that he's absolutely lionized in terms of Book 6. Now, in terms of the marriage of um, Marcellus and Julia, there isn't really much to say other than it seemed like a very happy marriage, etc., but we have no issue. So I'm going to move then on to the fact that in the next marriage, um, after Marcellus dies in 21 BCE, these are the successors and heirs that we need to know a lot about. Okay? For a start, we know that Agrippa becomes Augustus' son, adopted son, even though they are of the same age. So Agrippa comes into the family, and this is the way that he becomes a successor. And we know in Rome you have this mechanism for adoption, so that always adoption kind of trumps biology. But it does seem that Augustus still favours biology or close family relationships. The uh, children from the marriage of Agrippa to Julia, which incidentally by all accounts is a happy one, are Gaius, Julia, Lucius, and Agrippa Posthumus. We know the term Posthumus means that he was born after his father died. And Agrippa Posthumus uh, is adopted by Augustus, but only in 4 AD, far, far later than Gaius and Julia <coughs> and Lucius, who are his favoured um, heirs and who become what they call the princeps Uvertutus. Now the marriage uh, that follows the death of Agrippa to Tiberius is an absolute disastrous one. And as Yana knows, this is where things start to unravel. 
So after the death of Agrippa, Augustus seeks to promote Tiberius as his new son-in-law. And he feels that this will best serve his dynastic interest. So Tiberius marries Julia in 11 BC. But the problem is that Tiberius is forced to divorce Vipsania Agrippina. And this is, by all accounts, the absolute love of his life. Suetonius will tell us later that when he sees her, he would burst into tears. He was so disappointed by this. So right from the get-go, this was not a good marriage. Suetonius also tells us that Tiberius had a low opinion of Julia's character. And Tacitus tells us that, uh, Ty that um, uh, Julia considered Tiberius a social inferior. So the marriage was blighted by the start. Um, she does conceive a child, but she miscarries. And by 6 BC, uh, Tiberius departs for Rhodes. It's one of the key things about Tiberius, is even though Tiberius is the successor to, uh, or one of the successors to Augustus, he enjoys a kind of self-imposed exile. He goes off to Rhodes and he refuses to do anything. He has a bit of a hissy fit, to be absolutely honest with you. Okay. Now, what do we know about Julia? We know that she is the daughter by Scribonia, this relationship before Livia that didn't work, and that she is used really to secure Augustus's power. He does this with his sister first, doesn't he, Octavia? He asks her to marry uh, Mark Antony, and then his daughter fulfills a, a, a similar role. And Suetonius tells us about this in chapter 63. Now, I'm going to go on to the moral legislation as well, which we're going to do in a lot more detail later on. We know that the moral legislation, or the Lex Julia, uh, has a number of parts to it. One of the key parts to it is the prohibition of adultery. Now, this is very important, because up until this, adultery was a personal matter. So you could demand money or, you know, there may be a kind of assault or violence. But the idea was that you had to sort it out between the different families. Augustus kind of extends the state and he makes the state the moral guardians of Rome. And by extension, he places himself as the kind of arbiter of moral justice. This very much fits with his religious role that he's taking on. You know that he's taking on many different priesthoods and eventually will become Pontifus Maximus as well when Lepidus dies. And Suetonius in chapter 34 tells us, having made somewhat more stringent changes in the last of these than in others, he was unable to carry it out because of an open revolt against its provisions until he had abolished or mitigated a part of the penalties, besides increasing the rewards and allowing a three years exemption from the obligation to marry after the death of a husband or wife. And he goes on to tell us that even the knights, the equine classes, persistently called for a repeal of this. So if we're going to go with Suetonius, the Lex Julia is one of uh, Augustus's greatest failings, and it's an example of him overextending the role of Principit, and maybe overextending the role of the state, and getting a lot of pushback from this. Now, this may or may not be the case. What's certain is that there was definitely opposition to this rule. But it's interesting, because Augustus is often a populist, it's interesting that he pushes it through and decides that he's going to continue it, even though it would appear that it's very unpopular. Now, I'm going to argue that this clearly shows that this is part of his imperial agenda, but also a massive part of his imperial image. And we know this goes all the way back to Mark Antony when he starts to cast himself as the Apollo to Antony's Dionysus. He wants to show himself as the man of moderate appetites. An enormous amount of Suetonius's account of Augustus 
concerns, his lack of appetite, his Spartan living, the fact that he doesn't have beautiful furniture, the Spartan nature of his villa, etc. And so one of the great mysteries of Augustus is how he's able to reconcile this idea of being the kind of divia filius and later the diva kind of divine person together with also casted himself as a kind of every man, as a man of kibitas, uh, a civilian. Uh, we know that we should look when we do this very closely at his titles, his favorite titles. And of course, in English, one of his favorite, favorite titles is first among equals. So I'm going to argue that I think the insistence on this moral legislation, in spite of all of this resistance, is evidence that this was very important to the shaping of the imperial identity that he wanted to project to, his, uh, to the Principate. Now, unfortunately, Julia did not fit into this role whatsoever. We do not have Julia's account of anything, and it's a point that you could always make in your essays. A feminist historical point would be that female voices are invariably absent from all of our sources, aren't they? But what's going to happen with Julia, Julia um, a Major, and her daughter, unfortunately, as we'll find out later, is that she is going to fall foul of the moral legislation. She is in a very strong position. She is basically providing uh, the heirs to her father, isn't she? We know that she has Lucius and Gaius. Those are the pair of heirs, the most important ones that we'll see in the coins and everything. She is also the wife of Tiberius. So her position seems assured. Yet, in 2 BC, she's arrested for adultery and treason. And this is very interesting, class. Augustus sends her a letter in Tiberius's name. So he makes the accusation on behalf of Tiberius. Several of Julia's lovers, uh, including Gracchus, and then there was Julius Antonius, the son of Mark Antony and Fulvia, were forced to commit suicide. So we can see here again, Augustus dealing with people who fall foul of his laws very harshly indeed. Others have suggested that um, Julia's alleged paramours or lovers were members of a city clique who opposed Tiberius. Now, why this is important, guys, is this shows us in this kind of principle of universal consent, there is a lot of jostling for power. And this is going to be one of the big problems with the succession in general. There's going to be a lot of fighting. It is arguably quite bad with Augustus, with later emperors, it's going to become a, a battle to the death. And it shows the problem with the Principate, and it shows what I believe to be the greatest problem of Augustus's period, will be the succession and all of the instability and the problems that follow. So what happens to Julia? We know that she is exiled, and she is sent to Pandateria, guys, this is actually the island of Pandateria. You could walk it in less than an hour. So it's a very small island. It's a deliberately harsh punishment. And we know, don't we, Yana, that she is allowed no sight of men, and she is forbidden drink and nice food. And any men who uh, meet her, according to Suetonius, uh, Augustus wants a full account of everything, including the birthmarks on their body. Now, I think that that shows us the degree to which he wants to punish her and the degree to which he wants to control her. Sadly, her mother Scribonia chooses to go with her, so she sounds like a good mother, doesn't she? Okay. Five years after this exile on the island, she was removed to Regium on the mainland, but even there, she was very closely supervised. And we know that there was a lot of feeling in Rome by some of the dissenters that this was incredibly harsh treatment of Julia's daughters. In Augustus's will, we see the strength of feeling. This is Suetonius chapter 101. 
He gave orders that his daughter and his granddaughter Julia should not be put in the mausoleum if anything befell them. So even in death, Ruby, there was no forgiveness from the father. Um, and he also said, in the second, an account of what he'd accomplished, which he desired to have cut upon bronze tablets and set up in the entrance to the mausoleum. So we know that the mausoleum served as his legacy, as his life story. It's where Resgastai appears. And it's interesting what he once put in his autobiography and what he once left out. So Julia and Julia Minor both will be excised from the history books, never allowed to appear again. Now the, uh, uh, the Lex Julia of 18 uh, to 17 BCE, as I said, did stipulate that adultery would end in banishment. But some people argued that he could have given her um, a, 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 you know, a less onerous uh, 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 punishment if it wanted to. And Tacitus says that Augustus was stricter with his own uh, relatives than he was with others. Now, there are different ways of looking at this. You could say, that is fantastic governance. That's not, you know, allowing nepotism or any form of favoritism. This showed that there was a kind of republic element to the Principate. But Tacitus, as we know, who is always critical of Augustus, sees it as further evidence of his absolute ruthlessness. What it does show, doesn't it, is that he really wanted this image to be seen across Rome. Now, in 2 BC, he receives the title Pater, uh, Pater Patriae, Father of the Nation. And Suetonius tells us this was an incredibly important one to us. We can see it used in his coinage over and over again. And interestingly, class, later emperors will take the title too. I've argued before that it's a beautiful title for Augustus because rather than saying something like a dictator, you know, a dictator perpetuum like Julius Caesar did, part of Patriae, has the father, the paterfamilias, as we know in Rome, had absolute power, but it dresses it up in what Garrett Fagan calls warm and fuzzy language. So it takes the emphasis off patestas and puts it onto auctoritas and makes the relationship between the ruler and the ruled one of family. In uh, chapter 58, Suetonius tells us Augustus's eyes filled with tears, and he says, Having attained my highest hopes, fathers of the Senate, what more have I to ask of the immortal gods? Isn't that absolutely beautiful? So he's so moved by this. And it's perfect at framing the relationship that Augustus sought. We know in Res Gestae, 28 mentions of the Senate. Always the Senate are giving him these titles, aren't they? He is not requesting them. In fact, we know in Res Gestae that he rejects titles more often than he accepts them, does he not? And that's an important question that you may be answered, class. Why would Augustus embrace certain titles and reject others? Why would he love this one? You would write, want to write a really detailed paragraph on this, going into how this fits in with the lexicon of power that he approves of. What's really important as well in terms of the coinage is that you have Gaius and Lucius on the other side of this particular coin. And that is very interesting because he becomes the father of the two successors, also the father of the nation, and their title, and we're going to learn a little bit more about them later, of Princeps Juventutus is really important, literally like junior, uh, you know, Princeps. It's a new thing, and that's an example of innovation, and it also shows us a lot about the workings of succession. In a moment, I'm going to get you to write a paragraph from me, and um, I'm going to call it the Imperial Image Paragraph, and the question is going to be, what does the treatment of Julia Major tell us 
about Augustus's moral agenda. And I want you to put down all of these things in. I also want to remind you as good revision for uh, the uh, coming exam, each paragraph should end with a clincher sentence. A sentence that pulls the paragraph together and goes back to the title and defines how this paragraph fits in with your particular argument. So to end for today. The Apollo connection is incredibly important for uh, Octavian in the, in the 30s. I love saying the 1930s, don't I? But 30s BC. It's very important because it starts to establish Octavian and later Augustus as being on the, uh, on the side of moderation, on the side of reason and light, versus a kind of dark East, a Greek and Egyptian Hellenic East of appetite, of autocracy, of drinking, of dancing, of kind of intersex, of breeding animals and gods and humans together, of this kind of monstrous hybridity that we studied in the um, Aeneid Book 8. We know that the Spartan living projection of his uh, image is so important to him and Suetonius helps him in this regard and um, according to Suetonius he looks at his private correspondence to Tiberius he's often writing to Tiberius boasting about the severity of his fasts and everything we know that the religious office is so important in his projection and we looked at the Arapacus before and we saw together with things like the secular games and the Carmen Seculare how important religious office and the idea of him as a holy, pious man and how his whole family in the Arapacus are on display as evidence of a kind of beautiful, harmonious imperial family that will lead to a beautiful, harmonious Rome. We know that the creed of Pietas is absolutely central. And as you can see from this picture of Anchises being carried up uh, by Aeneas, that he does everything in his power to build linkage between himself and Aeneas and he's obliged in this respect by the brilliant Virgil who's going to make that uh, connection absolutely immortal. We know that with the help of Mycenas, his culture minister, that he works very closely with the poets and this fits in with the moral image, the religious image, the heroic image, the pietas image the builder of Rome, the transformer of Rome from brick to marble. All of these things are carefully choreographed, aren't they? And they work a great deal through the statues and the architecture we saw last time, the Forum, the Forum of Augustus, with the big statue of Augustus in the middle, with the uh, pageant of the heroes, which we also see in the Aeneid, how much time and effort goes into projecting this image. Now, how does that relate to Julia? It shows us that he puts image first, well above his relationship to his daughter, and it's an absolutely telling moment in which we can see how determined he is to shape Rome in his image. Thank you for listening.